Let's go around the room. The best player that Clark Kellogg faced in college, that might be hard because you have to remember who he was facing in the Big Ten. How about his entire career, the best player he ever faced? Todd, I'll start with you. I'm going to say Larry Bird. Okay. Seton? Yeah, Larry Bird's a good one. That's where I was going. All right. Marvin? Magic. Oh, okay. Paulie? I'm going to throw out because he was such a great defensive player when Clark was in the pros. I'm going to go Hakeem Olajuwon. Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to go uh, I'm going to go Larry Bird here. Let's bring in Clark Kellogg, the former Ohio State Buckeye. And he had a pacer. The best player you played against was? There were a ton of them in the early 80s. I got drafted in 82. Played only five years, guys. Uh, really three when you think number of games because of my left knee giving up on me as far as playing basketball. But Bird clearly is on the list. But the hardest guy for me to defend was Bernard King. Wow. Yeah, because he was um, an unbelievable scorer, had all the shots you needed to score from 20 feet and in. And it seemed like the Knicks at that time, Hubie Brown was coaching them. It seemed like they ran 65% of their plays (laughs) for him. (laughs) I remember asking him because I think he was around 6'5", Clark, is that – it was six, per- six, yeah, I give him six, 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 okay. six, six, six and a half long arms, though, so played a little taller than what he was. But, man, he was relentless in attacking you and attacking the basket. And I and I, he, I think he averaged 33 and a half one year. And what he, I said, how do you get your shot off against bigger guys, taller guys? He said uh, he started to shoot as he's turning around. Yes, he, he yes, didn't, He yes. didn't turn around to shoot. No. He, he no. went up and turned. That's right. And – it was rare yeah. if you got a piece of, of his shot there. Underrated. Yeah, it's quick release. Yeah, very underrated. Tremendous score. Great tenacity and ferocity when it came to playing the game and scoring the basketball. So he was a difficult guy for me to deal with personally. Marcus Johnson was in his heyday, too, at that time and um, was problematic. Uh, but hopefully I made it tough for the guys who had to deal with me for that. <laughs> For that short time that I was in the league. Well, you were too nice. I'm sure Larry Bird didn't trash talk you because you're a nice guy. <laughs> he was non-discriminatory, non-discriminatory <laughs> in, regards to, <laughs> in regards to who got well, Wait, what would he say to you? You're one of the nicest guys on the planet. What could like... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't get the brunt of it, uh, as I've heard over the years. You know, get your hands off of me. It's going to be a long night. You know, that kind of stuff. You can't guard me, you know. And he would do it like a ventriloquist because you couldn't see his mouth move. <laughs> Was that because of the mustache? That may have been part of it. That may have been part of it. But, man, I will tell you this. I mean, we had a game. We were, you know, we were struggling in the early 80s. Hadn't quite gotten. It was right before Reggie got there in 87 and then Smith's in 88 and the Davis boys. I was part of those teams as a broadcaster. Never got to play with Reggie, but I retired in 87. But there was a time when we actually found a way to beat the Celtics. Didn't happen. I think we beat them once. I hit a last second shot. We played them tough in the game. Then had in the, in the quirk of the schedule, sometimes you would play the same team back to back. One time at your place and then you'd go there. And we had, I don't know. I don't I don't know if Bird had played well or if he was frustrated. You know, anytime he came back to Indiana, you sensed he was a little more focused. Um, but anyway, we had played him well the night before the, the game before and then like within a few days we had to go to the garden and um he proceeded to to drop um 53 on on me and whoever else was guarding <laughs> him that night and um uh, I'll never forget that it was a it was a different level of focus from one of the greatest <laughs> players of all time do you yeah. think we'll get somebody scoring 90 points in a game in the NBA yeah um, yeah, I wouldn't say – heck, I didn't think we were going to see a 16 beat a one in the tournament in my broadcasting career, and it's happened twice in five years. <laughs> and so I'm uh, slowly but surely getting to the point where I won't say never. Yeah. Um, and the way the game is played now, Dan, I think it can happen. I mean, shoot, that's going 160, 170 um, more regularly than in past years. So, yeah, I think we'll probably see somebody um, approach 93 digits. I don't, I don't know, but but ninety seems uh, feasible at some point in the not too distant future. I'm wondering if uh, the blueprint for success in college basketball is maybe shying away a little bit more from the one and done. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you're seeing that shift. I do because of the transfer portal on um, the additional COVID year that was added. Um, I think expires next year, Dan, but it has created older teams, mm. uh, more older players. And some of the players that perhaps started at the non-power conference level by virtue of an additional year or two have become really good college players at 23 or 24 years old. And that has added to some of the parity we see. And I think you're right because there are other avenues for guys who really aren't interested in going to college and want to get their pro career started, you know, with the G League and the Ignite team. So there are other pathways if you're not interested in taking the college route. I do think you're going to see a little more of that shifting away from um, one and done. I think for one, there some many of them will elect to just go straight to pursuing a pro career like you would in Europe. I mean, those young, you know, Doncic and other guys, they've been pros well before they got to the United States. I mean, at 15, 16 years old, they're identified and tapped and tapped by clubs, and then they begin their pro journey. And so I think you'll see a little more of that. And as a result, um, you will see some of what we've um, seen over the last decade and a half. And it's kind of been amplified, I think, the last two years. Part of it is COVID. Part of it is obviously the transfer portal. Talking to Clark Kellogg, CBS Sports College basketball analyst. What surprised you last night? The brilliance of Marquise Noel was just something to behold. I mean, to set a tournament record with assists in a game that Michigan State played well enough um, to win on most nights. I mean, the turnovers were a problem and they couldn't corral Noel and his brilliance shined through when it needed to most. Um, that was special. I don't necessarily know if it was surprising because he had been he's been playing that way all season. For the most part, he's been carrying that team. He's the undisputed leader. Um, I tell you what, the play Gonzaga called down one, that was a designated play, Dan. That was not this kid decided to shoot that three. They that's, called that play. That's the Villanova trailer play. Yes, that's the Villanova trailer. Looked exactly like it. And that kid stepped into it, wasn't thinking about anything else but stroking that three. And that, me and Charles and Kenny were watching. I said, they called that play, you know, as it's unfolding. <laughs> and he let it fly. We're like, what? And it just, that was that was mildly surprising to see that play call, not to attack the rim. You're down, what are you down there, two? At the, no, you were well, you down one or two there. You were down, I can't remember. I've lost my mind now. I can't remember if it was one or two. They were, it was one. It was one. They were only down one. They were only, they went up two when he made it. So they're down one after Amari Bailey had hit that three. But to call that play, that was that was pretty pretty surprising and gutsy and uh, great theater. Great theater. But UCLA did defend it. They were ready for it. He he hit the. I mean, they jumped out on it. Yeah, but he was waved. He was like right at the – he was almost at half court. I mean, he was between the top of the three-point line yeah. and the half court logo. And it's really hard to – you're right. I think they did reasonably well defending it. But, man, he stepped into that thing with great confidence. And what a shot. What a game. What a finish. What do you expect tonight? What would be surprising to you tonight? Wow. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know what would – qualify as surprising i'm just going to enjoy the ride because we know and we've already seen it this year and we've seen it in past tournaments that they're coming it's hard <laughs> to predict where they where they're going to come from and in what fashion the surprise but like princeton is a 10-point underdog against creighton that would that shock but, you no it wouldn't shock me because they are one of the best rebounding teams in the country they've got multiple playmakers and shooters and they're playing well you know, you don't luck your way to the Sweet 16. You need some good fortune on occasion to win multiple games in the tournament. But the teams that get here are all capable of winning and advancing. So that wouldn't surprise me. I love Creighton, though. I love the way they've recaptured mm. how they played early in the season. You know, the first six, seven, eight games, they were rolling. They were really rolling. Fun to watch. Extremely versatile and balanced offensively. Play at a good pace. Defensively, they've gotten better, um, particularly with Kalkbrenner in the middle, anchoring the paint form. Uh, they're not very deep. Basically, play six and a half guys. But I, I really, I really thought Creighton was a dark horse 
team to, to get to Houston as a six seed, and they've uh, wait, wait, they, they've you proven said they're capable. They have six and a half player. They don't. They have a player who's a half a player. <laughs> no, no, wait. no. That's just a fi- that's just a figure of speech. Oh, man. okay. I was thinking, yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. Kansas State has one of those, and it's Marquise Noel. He's, he's <laughs> He, at 5 eight. He, you know, there are certain guys that defy logic on the basketball floor. I, yeah. Right? There, there'd be times yeah. you'd go play and you'd go, how is that guy doing yeah. what he's doing, right? Yeah, 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 no doubt. When I first saw, I came out of high school in 79, one of the really outstanding, perhaps the best high school class ever, with Worthy and Dominique Wilkins and Isaiah Thomas, Sam Bowie and Ralph Sampson and Sidney Lowe and Thurl Bailey and Dale Ellis and Dirk Minfield. When I first saw Isaiah Thomas in an all-star game I played in, I was like, how is this little dude doing what he's doing? <laughs> Ball handling, shot making, passing. I was like, my goodness. Then when I saw Ralph, <laughs> this dude's seven three, man, pulling up, pulling up <laughs> off the dribble. After he had raked the rebound and took it to the left and then pulling up from 20. I'm like, what the heck is this? You know, so, yeah, there are guys, when you see them, you're like, oh, my goodness. And it just has continued to ball. KD, Steph, you know, you can name LeBron combining just unbelievable basketball skill and savvy with uh, a, a, an unbelievable athleticism and physicality. I mean, so. Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of guys when you see them, you're like, whoa, man. This is, but I wonder, this is just... Isaiah Thomas underrated because it seems like a lot of players don't like him? And he played for the Pistons, and they didn't like the bad boy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, you can't disconnect some personal feelings towards a guy in terms of how he'll be discussed, but the credentials are obvious. And I tell you, in conversations, barbershop talk, talk radio talk, when you start talking about uh, – dynamic, great, smaller guys, he's in the head of the class. I mean, he's on the short list of the roll call. I mean, there's no way to deny that. Why I mean, are you going to put him on a – you put him on a short list. What are you doing? You can't put him on a no, he's short one of list. The best but, but, but we got to <laughs> – that's part of it. I mean, again, so Zeke was 6'1", 6'2", yeah. with 6'1", but uh, fantastic, man. Marvelous, marvelous player. And uh, – because I'm, I'm a little biased because he's part of uh, my era and my, my high school class. And uh, and I got to see him up close in college and then a little bit in the pros. And then we had crossed paths in some high school all-star games. So, yeah, he's uh, he's clearly one of the one of the great players of all time. And I do think sometimes he gets a little bit short riff because of uh, <laughs> how some people felt about him and those Detroit teams. But I'm sure he's he's um, reconciled though that with um, a couple of championship rings and Hall of Fame, I, I'm sure he's he's fine with that. He's got a great place in the game's history, that's for sure. How do you explain the Joker? Oh, my goodness. I, I can't, other than he's marvelous to watch, man. Um, you know, I just read an article not too long ago where they talked about somebody, I think George Ravelin, yeah, Coach Ravelin sent me an article about how players from that part of the world have really – made an impact on the game. There have been a number of great players come from there. How they all are trained, no matter how big they become, they're trained in basketball skills. All skills. Footwork. Shot making, footwork, handling the ball, passing. And that's the way they're taught the game from when they start playing. And if they end up being 6'10 or 7 feet or 6'9, they play a style that's beautiful to watch because it's so fundamentally um, sound. And uh, man, he's oh my goodness, he's a joy to watch. He's he's a um, he's a ballerina uh, with um, a body of an old school center. And man, it's um, yeah, he's 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 amazing. So is Joel Embiid, yeah. for that matter. When well, you if you about, look at the best yeah. players in the game, they're yeah. not from the United yeah. States. Mm. Great point, Dan. right? Yeah, Luka, Giannis, Luca, yeah. yeah, yeah, Giannis, yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you Man, go back? Once, you know, you had you had Dirk, but you had yeah. Manu. Uh, yeah. I remember Sharunas Marshallonis was yeah, Marshallonis was uh, one of the Peja first. Peja Stoyakovic. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm thinking of the other guy too, um, Drazen, Drazen oh, Petrovic. Yeah, 
the great Drazen before his tragic yeah. early death. Um, yeah, um, yeah, there were a number of guys that, but now it seems like there's more of a proliferation of them, but some of that is just more kids can see them and emulate them and aspire to that and, and make their mark too going forward. What's it like spending the day or night with Barkley? <laughs> oh, man, it is such a treat, man. He's just such a genuinely good guy, first and foremost. And he's naturally funny. I mean, he's not putting – I mean, he's naturally funny. He's quick-witted, very, very sharp, knows the game, knows people, uh, successful business guy. I mean, he's just he's, – he's a joy to be around. He's a joy to be around. There's a mutual respect we have, he and I and Kenny and Greg and Ernie and Seth, the whole crew, man. We have a great respect. But he's he's unique, man. There's just not many guys like him in terms of genuine humility, graciousness as a superstar celebrity, and uh, great humor, naturally funny. And uh, he, it's easy and fun to be around. And that's um, that's a gift. That's a gift. Great talking to you again. And always dp always, always great. i look forward to it man whenever we get a chance to chop it up keep doing what you're doing man Thanks. i remember you trying to dunk when we went and did a game when we were working at espn i think you i think you got it over the rim i think you actually it was kind of a it was kind of a um, dirty snow dunk it wasn't like clean white snow but it was it was still legit it counts for white guys though Oh, you're qualifying it. <laughs> yeah. I was, you know, we call that a rub dunk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was looking for terminology. That's better. Than yeah, a little I, rub dunk. Because yeah. I remember we were shooting around. We were at UMass. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. Midnight Madness. Where would that have been, Dan? That had to be like late 80s, right? Pro- well, Calipari was there. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was his first year there. I think it was like eight. I think it was like 89. Or, yeah, yeah, 88, 89, or 90, right? And, and he heard that I was uh, dunking. He came out of the locker room, and he wanted. Yeah. He was like, oh, I hear I hear you're, you're uh, trying to dunk here. I said, I'm not trying. I'm dunking. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Cal. Uh, they they might have had Camby that year. Uh, I don't think he had gotten there yet. He he was there in '96, so I oh, don't think okay. he had gotten there. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That was yeah. That was well after us. Yeah. Okay. I think that might have been Cal's first year there. Yeah. So I might have been one of the better players on the floor back then. You could have been. Yeah. You very well could have been at that time. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Uh great to talk to you again, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. Clark Kellogg, CBS. We'll take a break. Some phone calls coming up next. 